the wave nature of light was very well known. It was known before any of the invention of radio or any of the electromagnetic waves or anything. It was known in the 1820s. There was a guy named Young who figured it out. This is his original picture that he showed when he gave a talk like this in 1820, or maybe it's 1803. Yeah, 1803, really a long time ago. Can you imagine he made that picture with like a pen and things? I mean, this was like uh, and, and what you can see from the picture is that you take a wave which is a big distributed thing, goes up and down like this, and it has a wavelength, which is the distance between the peaks, and it has a frequency, which is how long it takes for it to go up and down. And this wave, and you put it through two very narrow slits, and what happens is, as it hits that, little waves get generated at each of these holes, and as they go out, two of these waves can be added to one another. So you can add waves on top of one another. It's a very important concept we'll come back to in a minute. It's called superposition. And if, if, if one is up and the other one is down, they cancel. So they actually add up they, and, and, and cancel one another. That's, not, that's a very non-trivial physical phenomenon. I mean, there's no reason to think, you know, if I take two marbles and throw them at each other, normally they don't add up to be zero marbles, right? But waves can do this, and they go up and down, and you can put a, a screen back here and look and see the pattern you get out, and you get a pattern of bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark which is where the, uh, the things have added up or, sub or subtracted. So that's the characteristic spread out pattern, I call it, of light and dark, that you get from waves. It's known as the interference pattern, uh, and this is the two-slit interference experiment. It's, a, it, 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 it's in a lot of laboratories. Some, some of your schools might even have a, a, a chance to do this experiment, because you can do it very beautifully now with a laser. It's always a little hard to get the right kind of light before, but now you can. So the early tests of the, of the new atomic regime, so they knew about that. So it was a second. So they, so they had light being this, and everything was going great with light being a wave, except for something that suddenly didn't work. And this was the photoelectric effect. Now, the photoelectric effect is what was considered really cool at the time. You put a piece of metal down, and you shine a light on it, and uh, electricity comes out. And so that is really cool, extremely useful, and still, of course, very, very important to us. Uh, the light on metal produces outgoing electrons. As I said, the electron had been discovered in 1897, the first of the elementary particles to be discovered. The first idea really helped with the confirmation of the idea that everything was actually atomic in nature. Thermodynamics and so on, Newtonian mechanics, they don't care if things are atomic or just big solid things, but now we're starting to discover that things are. And they did the experiment, and it was all wrong for an electromagnetic wave. With a wave, if you think of a wave, the energy comes in, and then more comes in, more comes in, and you just sort of add up. Think of the sand on a beach. You bring sand in, you bring some more sand in, you bring some more sand in. You gradually pile the sand on a beach higher and higher, which means that you have a hill which has potential energy. You've actually added energy to that beach. As you, as you bring things in. So energy is brought in gradually by waves. And there should be a time lag after you turn that light on as the energy builds up and eventually there'd be enough energy to push the electron out. Okay? Does that make sense? That, that, that you turn this thing on and then you wait and then gradually it would get hotter somehow and then the electron would come out. That was not what happened. Turn the light on, bang, immediately the electrons come out. Even more bizarre, you had a different color light and it stopped. The color, color, where did that come from? <laughs> right? They knew what color was. Color was a, it had something to do with the frequency of the light because you, you could figure that out by using prisms like Newton did and doing two slit experiments like Young did. So they knew that. But what's it got to do with this? Nothing. So this picture shows, I love this picture. It shows you an infrared light hits this thing, no particles come out. The red light hits it, no particles come out. A blue light hits it, all of a sudden particles come out. An ultraviolet light hits it, all of a sudden faster particles come out. Okay, we have a mess on our hands. Uh, and I would say that we were really lucky in that period to have some uh, brilliant people like Dr. Einstein, who besides inventing relativity, also invented what's called the explanation of this, the photoelectric effect. In 
the same year that he was doing relativity, he was doing this, he was also doing another explanation of the Brownian motion, and he was working a full-time job and had two little kids. So, <laughs> imagine uh, that was a, he was a smart guy. And, light, and he said light comes in little particles called photons. Now the idea of light being a stream of particles is ancient goes back to the ancient Greeks, as a matter of fact, and Newton believed it very strongly. He wrote a book called Optics in which light was a stream of particles, but it had been pretty much trashed by all this wave business that was going on and that I, that I was talking about. That was, you know, because you, know, you knew now it was a distributed wave, electromagnetic wave, in fact. We figured everything out, right? It was 1900. In fact, there were people who said, we figured everything out. That's it. No more. I'm sorry. <laughs> they were a little bit wrong. <laughs> Each packet... So he said this light comes in little packets. Now, this is a typical Einstein thing. He, he, he said, well, it can't be like that, but it is anyway. And be right. If you can do that, I recommend the career in physics, really. <laughs> so each packet is absorbed individually. And the energy of the packets, he said, depends on the frequency of the wave. Huh? <laughs> As it, energy equals this constant, H, which they do from another experiment, times the frequency, which we, we're using a Greek letter there. That's a Greek letter, nu. Uh, you may not have seen it before, but we use it for the frequency. I would say this appears to make no sense at all. You have now reached a, sen a, a state of linguistic confusion, which, uh, which, which is, uh, it, is logically seems to be completely inconsistent. I mean, it, it explains all the facts, however. It won the Nobel Prize and it changed the world. So, it made no sense at all. Uh, people had very great questions about whether this could be uh, could be used. Something didn't make any sense here. We have now a wave with frequency, which is little chunks. I'm sorry, but that doesn't go. It's as if a wave at the beach suddenly resolved itself into nothing but a large but individual surfer you know, coming down with, with on, riding on nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or one surfer, even worse. A silver surfer. No. So th th I like to talk about real world applications. This is a, the first real world application that I knew of of the, uh, of the of one of the photoelectric effect, a very important one for us, the photomultiplier tube. Every particle physics experiment that you will be toured to see around here has a million of these in it. Uh, in sensitive applications, you can detect individual photons coming in one by one. Bang, bang, bang. You can actually see the individual pulses. A light comes in, it goes through a window, it hits a piece of metal, an electron comes out, hits a piece of metal, makes a bunch more electrons come out. They gradually amplify, and then you get enough at the end to where you can measure it. My personal fun fact connected with this thing is that the first application was in the, was in the, the first sound that they put in movies. Movies were silent until the 30s, uh, 1930s that is, and uh, when they eventually made them work, they worked by putting a trace on the film that was dark or light or dark or light on the side where you can't see it projected on the screen. And they put uh, shine a light through there and get a stronger or weaker light which would go through into one of these and make a signal which they would put into a audio system, and then you could hear something. So that was actually cool. They were using the uh, the most recent physics possible to do uh, to do movies. So every time it turns out today, one of the hot applications is uh, computer graphics.